you never know what quite what to do with. So we really appreciate uh, Christine Ashimagawa uh, for joining us. So yeah, so this is uh, Dr. Wen. I'm a geriatrician at the Department of Geriatric Medicine at Japsom and glad that you're joining us for our monthly geriatrics echo. We run the series on the second Wednesday of each month from 12 to 1 as a one hour session. After a short lecture from an expert, we will share expertise from the rest of the team and open up time for case discussion. And we invite you to share any geriatrics cases. doesn't have to be uh, pertinent to this topic, but certainly they, they always kind of show up. Um, and, um, you know, we all have collective wisdom that we can all share with each other. And it really helps build our little community as well. The only thing we ask you to do is keep it HIPAA compliant, and um, for, during the case discussion, we can certainly discuss cases without names. Um, and for anyone who presents a full case, we'll have the opportunity to receive a $150 gift card from uh, ECHO from the AHAC. Uh, the CME, is, uh, uh, CME activity is sponsored by the Hawaii Consortium of Continuing Medical Education, and it's a joint venture between Hawaii Medical Association and the John A. Burns School of Medicine at UH. This is also approved for the National Association of Social Workers, the Hawaii chapter for up to one social work CE. And also as a reminder, you must complete the evaluation form in order to receive CMEs and CEs or certificates of attendance. So evaluations can be found on our website under the evaluations tab or following the link in the chat box. And we also ask that you enter your full name, if you haven't already, full name and credentials of everyone in attendance in the room with you in the chat box so that we may keep attendance. Okay, as you know, all sponsors of CME are required to execute a conflict of interest policy and speakers are expected to disclose the audience any real or apparent conflicts and we are happy to say that Christine Shimagawa has disclosed she has no relationships with commercial supporters that can be perceived as a conflict of interest. So. Okay, today's topic is <coughs> APS, Mandated Reporter Training. And um, so Christine Shimagawa, she's been with the State of Hawaii Department of Human Services, Social Services Divisions for 29 years. Her experiences include direct line services and child welfare services as an adoption and permanency worker and in the intake unit assessing child abuse and neglect reports. She's also headed the Elder Abuse Financial Exploitation Pilot Program for Adult Protective Services. So for the past six years, she's been the supervisor for the uh, statewide Adult Protective Services Intake Unit, which receives reports of alleged abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. She's also provided mandated reporting, uh, reporter in-service training to various agencies, hospitals, nursing facilities, police academy, uh, financial institutions, nonprofit agencies, etc. And I just want to introduce the rest of our team here. We have Mary Gottam here. She's recently retired from the Department of Public Health, public health nursing, but she's very kindly agreed to continue with us on the ECHO with her wealth of knowledge. And we have Debbie Shimizu. She's online over there on the ECHO. And she's a social worker with the Department of Health as well. And Chad Kawakami is usually with us. He's associate professor of pharmacy, but he cannot be here today. Okay, and so just finally, just a couple of logistics. Um, stay HIPAA compliant, don't share protected health information. There's a mute button at the bottom left hand corner, uh, so please make sure it's on mute, otherwise we're going to hear lots of extraneous noise. And oh, Please unmute yourself if you want to speak up. And there is a chat button as well, which if you press it will bring up a chat box, and if you haven't already, type your name and location and all those in the room with you as our way of keeping attendance. So we're ready to go. So. Take it away. Thank you. Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share what we do at Adult Protective Services. Just, um, you can see the PowerPoint. Okay. Having some screen difficulties. Okay, there we go. Okay, so today I will be covering the following. What is APS, or Adult Protective Services? What our goals are? We'll talk about capacity. Who is a vulnerable adult? The different types of, of abuse and definitions. Who are mandated reporters? And how to go about making a report to Adult Protective Services. 
So what we do is when a report comes into the statewide intake uh, reporting office, we receive and investigate reports of abuse to vulnerable adults. Our services are short term because we're there to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the vulnerable adult who has been abused, neglected, or financially exploited. So we are strictly an investigative function. When our investigators go out and um, stabilize the situation, address the abuse and neglect, if the vulnerable adult needs ongoing supportive services, we will make referrals to community resources, to possibly Elder Affairs Division, if the client needs Meals on Wheels, case management services, bathing services, what have you. So we don't have a case management component within the Adult Protective Services branch. So our goals, first and foremost, we're there to ensure the safety of the vulnerable adult, stabilize the situation, and most importantly, respect the individual's right to self-determination. As all of you know, if the vulnerable adult has the capacity to make decisions, he or she can choose how they wanna live, where they wanna live. They can also choose whether or not they are going to accept APS intervention. There are times when you know, all of you and even us at APS um, have difficulty because we certainly see a vulnerable adult being in a very um, difficult situation that we really want to engage with, provide services, only to be told by that vulnerable adult, no thank you, I don't want your help. I know my son hit me and I have a black eye, but I don't wanna press charges, please leave my property, and then we have to leave if that person has capacity to tell us they don't want our help. So capacity, that's a big one. According to the Hawaii Revised Statute, this is the definition of capacity. The ability to understand and appreciate the nature and consequences of making decisions concerning one's person or to communicate these decisions. So at APS, None of the APS staff are equipped or trained or have the ability to determine whether a person lacks capacity. What we can do though is when we are seeing that client face to face through our observations, we can do uh, screening tools to see if that capacity is questionable. And if it is, then we will take the next step to have that person's capacity assessed. So again, as you can see there, if capacity is at issue, the vulnerable adult must be examined by a psychiatrist or qualified physician. And only a court can uh, make a finding that that person lacks capacity to make decisions concerning their personal needs or property. Now, Adult Protective Services, you know, we do have uh, challenges of sometimes getting a client to see a physician because they haven't left their home in years or because of some paranoid behavior or what have you, they are very resistant. So in that case, we will attempt to bring a psychiatrist who we have contracted with. Uh, Dr. Buffenstein is one um, physician or psychiatrist that we have contracted with as well as Dr. Raymond Davidson who have gone out with our APS social workers to assess the vulnerable adult's capacity for us. And if they uh, deem that specific individual to lack capacity, then they will write a letter attesting to that, and then we will use that letter to go and petition the courts for guardianship for that uh, vulnerable adult. When a report is made to Adult Protective Services, the intake reporting office, the first thing that the intake worker has to determine is if the alleged victim is a vulnerable adult. So again, a vulnerable adult, according to the Hawaii B. White statute, is anyone 18 years of age or older. They have to have some type of mental, developmental, or physical impairment and be unable to do one of the following. Okay, 
So oftentimes we'll get a report and um, through the intake workers um, questioning of the complainant or reporter, if there's no information to indicate that the alleged victim is a vulnerable adult, then that's where the report stops. We can't move any further in um, intervening. So again, that is the primary um, eligibility first and foremost. Once a person is deemed to be a vulnerable adult, is that a question? Is that I don't, feedback? I don't, I don't, I don't, I think that's feedback. Okay. So um, once we determine the person is a vulnerable adult, then the intake worker will look at what is the specific harm or neglect that's being reported, and does that information fall within the definition of the following types of abuse. So this is the types of abuse that we are tasked with, according to the law, to investigate. Self-neglect, physical abuse, caregiver neglect, financial exploitation, psychological abuse, and sexual abuse. So self-neglect, this is one of the most difficult types of abuse and neglect for us at the intake level to determine eligibility. And the reason for that is, as you can see, they, can, they not only have to be a vulnerable adult like any other types of abuse, but they also have to appear to lack understanding or capacity to make or communicate responsible decisions. And third, they have to be exposed to a situation where they're at immediate risk of death or serious physical harm. So all three have to be met for APS to intervene on a self-neglect case. There are many times where reports come in that the person is clearly vulnerable and clearly at, uh, in a situation they're at immediate risk for serious harm. But the reporter is not giving us any information to indicate that the person's capacity is somewhat questionable. Now, we are not expecting anybody in the community to tell us, oh, yeah, definitely this person lacks capacity and have all the key phrases to tell us that. But the intake worker is going to ask specific questions to give us some indication that that person's cognition has declined or there's some memory impairments. So that's the key that we're looking for, some tangible information from the reporter to show that there is some questionable cognition issues with that vulnerable adult. And if that is the information provided to us and that is met, all three will take an in for self-neglect. One thing I want to highlight with self-neglect, though, is uh, for those of you that are listening, if you're calling from a... Um, hospital setting, if the person is in the hospital, admitted to the hospital, and it's a self-neglecting client, we don't take those cases because at the time that the call is coming in, the person is in the hospital. They're safe. They're not at immediate risk for serious harm or death. So the hospital then is tasked with a safe and appropriate discharge when that person is ready to move on to a different type of setting or home environment. So I just kind of want to throw that in there because we do get a lot of calls from those kinds of situations where um, clearly self-neglecting, but we don't take they're questioning why we don't take it. It's because they're in a safe setting. Okay, okay going on to physical abuse. That's the definition. It's a non-accidental infliction that causes pain or impairment. Now, as you can see on the bottom, improper physical restraints. Um, in the state of Hawaii, my understanding is that without a doctor's order, no one should be physically restraining a client or an adult. A lot of unfortunate reports that we are receiving are coming from maybe uh, care home situations or facilities where the care home operator is using some type of cloth. We got one recently that they were using chucks to tie the resident's hand to the bed because of aggressive behavior. That is considered physical abuse without a doctor's order, okay? Um, 
with physical abuse, um, you know, we, I just, as a, we got a, we had a case where a certified nurse assistant was observed punching a demented client in the stomach. And we confirmed on that case. Now that CNA uh, asked for a fair hearing because anytime we confirm a case on a licensed individual, those findings do go to the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs and the Professional Vocational Licensing Office. And uh, they may revoke that person's license and then they can't work in the state of Hawaii again. So 99% of the time, any licensed entity that's confirmed by uh, APS will ask for a fair hearing. Well, that particular case, we, he asked for a fair hearing and we lost that fair hearing because uh, the demented client could not remember or could not articulate that he felt pain at the time that he was punched in the stomach, nor was there any visible injury at the time of the incident. So our uh, confirmation had to be overturned. Since then, we have since learned from that situation. And if we receive that kind of report where there's no visible injury or the client didn't feel pain and the perpetrator is a caregiver, we will bring that case in as caregiver neglect. And I'll explain that as we go on to that caregiver neglect portion. But again, there has to be some visible injury or the client have, has uh, had to have said they felt pain. Okay, so this is the legal definition of a caregiver. Now it doesn't have to be anybody who's licensed or a power of attorney or a contract. It's anybody who knowingly or willingly assumed the care of a vulnerable adult. And these are just some examples of caregivers. Okay, so even healthcare facilities are considered caregivers. So caregiver neglect. It's when the caregiver fails to exercise a degree of care that a reasonable person with the responsibility of caregiver would exercise within the scope of their assumed legal contractual duties. So going back to that case of that physical abuse case, we are bring it in now for caregiver neglect because a reasonable caregiver, a licensed CNA, wouldn't punch a client in the stomach, right? So those cases now come under caregiver neglect. Um, one thing that we don't investigate is when we have two vulnerable adults perpetrating on each other, okay? So cases of two clients in a, a, light, a residential facility, one client may be seen punching another client in the face and the other client sustains a black eye. We'll get reports of that. Incident reports come to our office, but we don't look at that as physical abuse by the vulnerable adult to the other vulnerable adult. What we look though at is what is the facility doing as caregivers to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of the clients in their care. So if we get a report that Mrs. Tanaka punched Mrs. Smith in the face and we get the report, we'll ask the facility, what are you doing to ensure that this doesn't happen again? They'll tell us, oh, well, we'll update the care plan so that Mrs. Tanaka is going to be supervised one-on-one. -on -one. She's going to be, um, she's not going to be on the same floor as Mrs. Smith. Okay, we'll, we'll be satisfied with that. We'll document that information. However, if we get a report a month later with the same situation of Mrs. Tanaka hitting Mrs. Smith again, we're going to say, hey, what happened? What happened to the care plan? What happened? Was there something that wasn't followed. If we find that there was a misstep, then we may bring it in for caregiver neglect against the facility because they didn't protect Mrs. Smith from that second incident. Okay, so these are just some of the things that one through seven that we would expect any caregiver to ensure of the vulnerable adult. Financial exploitation. 
breach of a fiduciary duty, such as misuse of power attorney or the mis misuse of guardianship privileges, resulting in the unauthorized sale or transfer of property, or the unauthorized taking of personal assets. Okay, so, you know, we all know in Hawaii, it's very challenging for people to make ends meet. And we are unfortunately seeing an increase of uh, caregiver neglect situations uh, by family members who really are kind of stuck because maybe their loved one uh, needs 24 seven care or supervision or they need more hands on care than they can really actually provide. But instead of the family agreeing to a different setting for their loved ones, such as a care home or a foster home because of financial constraints. They choose to bring their loved one home thinking that they can provide that kind of care to that individual. So we, you know, feel that if that's what the family wants to do, okay, fine. But when that turns into less than optimal care to that vulnerable adult where we're seeing bed sores, we're seeing a lot of neglect because the family is not able to maybe turn that loved one uh, every two hours or ensuring that they're getting their medications on time or the client is wandering because nobody's home to supervise. Then, you know, we get involved because there's some neglect concerns. But on top of that, it kind of also brings in the financial exploitation because they may be using their loved one's money for things other than the client's support and maintenance. So a lot of times family members are choosing to bring their loved ones home because they need that person's social security or pension money to help with the mortgage or help paying the utilities. And if the loved one were to go into out of home placement, the money needs to follow. So that's the kind of cases that we are seeing. We also get reports from uh, nursing facilities where, uh, or care home operators where the um, family member that's tasked with making sure that the client's money is going towards room and board, that that's not happening. So they're in arrears for like 20,000 plus and it's just increasing every month. That's considered financial exploitation when that money is not effectively being used for that vulnerable adult's care and maintenance. Okay, psychological abuse. Um, this one is challenging because, um, as you can see there, for psychological abuse, what we have to see at the intake level is how did that psychological abuse incident affect that person, uh, did they, were they profoundly confused or frightened by that incident? Okay, so a lot of people will ask or will question, well, how can a person that has dementia or a person that has a developmental disability, right, if they can't articulate that they were frightened, how can then APS or intake take that kind of case? So what we will ask is, was there any witnesses to that incident? If someone can say that, yes, I was present when the uh, son yelled at his mother and she started crying and she, you know quivering and there was that reaction. If somebody can give us that information, then we can support it coming in as psychological abuse because there was an observable behavior by a witness. Okay, so again, the key thing there for psychological abuse is, was that vulnerable adult profoundly confused or frightened by that incident? Sexual abuse, um, we don't get many uh, sexual abuse type uh, reports to our agency, but the ones that we do receive, um, the clients are usually our young adults, the developmentally disabled adults who are still maybe going to high school, 
Um, some are going to day programs and are being sexually assaulted by staff members, uh, handy van drivers. Um, so those are usually the kinds of uh, cases that we're seeing at APS. Okay, so mandated reporters. This is what the state law requires. All personnel, social services, law enforcement, healthcare, medical examiners or coroners. Yes, report, the report, not the reports are confidential, but the reporter, the complainant's identity is confidential. Um, you know, what I wanna impress upon is that, you know, we do have to keep the complainant's uh, identity confidential, but sometimes the family, the client, family members may figure it out because maybe the service provider is the only one that was in the home when the incident occurred. So they may confront you and ask, you know, whether or not you were the one that called APS. That would be up to you as an individual or if you work for an agency, what your policies are for that. But please be reassured that uh, APS, because of our confidentiality laws, we do not and cannot reveal your identity without your consent. The official mandated reporter form is on that link of our website. So if you suspect in your uh, professional or official, official duties that a uh, vulnerable adult has been abused or will be in danger of abuse if immediate action is not taken. We ask that you call or make your report by faxing it or emailing it as soon as possible. Um, we are not, unlike Child Protective Services, where they have a 24-hour hotline and they have an emergency response team, APS does not have that. APS is strictly Monday through Friday, 7.45 to 4.30. But it never fails where Friday afternoon at 4.15, we get a call or a report of a self-neglect client. And this is no lie. Last Friday, we had six self-neglect self reports from 3 to 4.30 that we had to triage statewide. And that was a challenge. So I strongly urge all of you mandated reporters to call in any report as quickly as possible because that will only help us to determine eligibility quicker. And if we can send an intake, I mean, an investigator out, we will try to do so within, again, not looking at the normal business hours. We are not an emergency type of function. So if there is an emergency, we always advise to call 911. Okay, so if, you, I, if you're not sure, you wanna make a report, you can always call and ask for a consult. We always advise that to call for a consult and the intake worker can guide you. Um, if you want to make a report, by all means, I think the best method would be to fax it to us or email it. We check that every half hour. Um, and if it's something urgent, I encourage you to do call the reporting line, leave your uh, name and number on the voicemail that's checked every half hour. Just say where you're from, say this is urgent, and then we'll give you a call back. Okay, any questions? Can you uh, open up the lines so I can see the chat? Okay, I'm sure there's questions, so. Uh, let's see. So if you want to unmute yourself and speak up, or you could type your question into the chat. I'm sure there is questions uh, that we have here. Okay. Well, I just want to uh, just point out that, you know, there is, because I'm just anticipating, right? There's a question, what's the difference between capacity and confidence, yeah. So um, cap capacity is something that any physician, any primary care physician, you know, family practice, internal medicine, uh, typically, I mean, uh, you know, psychiatrists, neurologists, um, uh, um, 
and geriatricians uh, do this, but um, but actually any any physician can determine capacity, and then they sort of take that up, and then the court determines competence. It's the court is a, it, it, competence is a legal definition, and capacity is a medical one, and so I just want to make that that distinction uh, for the two of you uh, for the, for those those two things, and then also just want to uh, point out that capacity is is um, task specific. Just because you you know you have to ask about capacity for you know is it about financial decision making or is it about making a decision about you know a medical treatment or something like that and so they're not the same thing it's not just one global capacity it's really very task specific. Um, if I can chime in on that, yeah. so uh, APS when we go for guardianship, obviously we have to do ask the physician to do a global capacity because you're taking away that person's rights. So we don't separate uh, uh, guardianship for person or property. It's guardianship as everything, the whole person um, and their finances. Yes. Okay, there's questions here. Okay, apologize if I missed this. Can you speak to the penalties for not reporting as a mandated reporter? Okay, so uh, the penalty is, it's a petty misdemeanor if you fail to report as a mandated reporter. The next one is how many investigators on Oahu are they MSWs? Okay, um, how many investigators? Well, we have actually, I believe, 10 social work, 10 investigative positions. Currently, half are filled, and not all of them have MSWs. If patient is a fall risk and falls at home, but it's an accident, is that neglect? Well, I mean, if it's an accident, then no, it's not neglect per se. Um, you know, we're looking at non-accidental injury, but if it's an accident and if it's a caregiver who failed to monitor that person, then that might be con concerns for caregiver neglect, yes. Uh, will mandated reporter be informed by APS if case will be picked up or not? Okay, thank you for asking that, yes. so. The intake um, process is not complete until the intake worker tells you what they're doing with your report. So you're, you're um, going to get, yes, the case uh, information meets our criteria for an investigation, or you're going to get, I'm sorry, it doesn't meet the criteria, and they should explain the reason why, and that they're going to be documenting this as an information only report in our database. So that's when the intake process is complete, is when the intake worker gives you their disposition of your report. Um, can you scroll up a little bit? There were a couple of other questions that coming in quick. A little bit further out was the last one. Have you worked on a case where a family member was incarcerated for financial abuse? Hmm. You know, that's, I don't believe we have, but if that were the case, um, is the vulnerable, wait, is the vulnerable adult the one that's incarcerated or the perpetrator? Uh, I think family member. Family member, member yeah. perpetrator. Yeah. Okay. So what we would look at is, does that perpetrator, even though he or she is incarcerated, what is their ability to still have access to that victim's money? So how imminent is that risk? Because if he or she's incarcerated, if there's no uh, imminent risk, then we may you know, not take it. What we have to look at is maybe referring the family member or whoever's dealing with this issue to other entities such as maybe uh, legal, somebody getting legal advice or something like that. But it depends. The financial one is really about stopping the bleeding and making sure that the perpetrator no longer has access to the victim's monies or credit cards. So that's where we would have to determine if we're going to intervene or not. I think the question is if anyone has ever gone to jail for... Oh, is that the question? For yeah. being, for financially abusing. A family member? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. You know, that's a good question. I haven't seen a family member. We've seen non-family members go to jail for um, financial exploiting a vulnerable adult. 
but family members we haven't seen. And again, that's not something that I guess we have any control over, right? That's a criminal issue. Um, the prosecutor's office get our reports. It's up to them if they're going to pick up the case. But I don't believe in the seven years that I've been there where I've seen an actual family member get incarcerated for that. Okay, scroll down a little bit. So what is the process for establishing guardianship and what happens to the individual situation in the interim? Okay, that's a, quite a long process. So, you know, when we at APS uh, go and have that person assessed and the physician tells us, yes, the person lacks capacity, the social worker then has to um, go and hunt for any family members or that's related to this client and notify them and ask them if they're willing to be a legal guardian. That takes a lot of research, time and effort, searching the internet, calling the mainland. We have to get legal documents, birth certificates, death certificates. So once we get all that information, then the social worker has to uh, write up their social summary and we send it to our attorney general's office for them to review our reports. And um, once everything is in place, then we get a court date. What we are seeing is sometimes three to six months for that whole process to take place. Um, if we are unable to find a family member or anybody, a friend, neighbor, willing to step up and be the legal guardian for that individual, then we will ask the courts to appoint the Office of Public Guardian to be in charge of that vulnerable adult. What happens if um, a family member is willing to, to petition the court for guardianship um, and APS hasn't been involved? Is it, is it still that, does it still take that long to get the guardianship for the my understanding is that if a person, a family member does it on their own, it might be a little longer even because mm -hmm. with APS, all we need is one physician's letter of incapacity. Mm -hmm. Family members, anybody on the outside have to have two letters is my understanding. I'm not sure if that's correct. But that's what I've been told. And on top of that, families have to pay the legal, legal fees, fees, which right. is eight to ten thousand dollars sometimes or more depending on your attorney so again but what i also want to uh, bring up is aps is we don't get involved just because a person doesn't have a legal guardian so we often get calls like this after i do in service trainings like oh so and so lacks capacity and you need a legal guardian aps we heard you can do the guardianship no we don't just intervene for that. There has to be a protective issue for us to address. Mm -hmm. And if in that process, there's a capacity guardianship issue, then the worker has to address it. Um, the next one, if someone lacks capacity and they're living in a home but at risk for serious injury or otherwise, can APS get involved and have authority to place someone in long-term care? Okay, so we cannot force anybody, even APS, even if a person has a legal guardian, we can't force someone to go and live where they don't want to live or take medication but against their will. It's very challenging. So people will often ask them, what is the purpose of getting a guardianship then if you can't force them to do something to ensure their safety? Guardianship is really comes into play when the person is in need of a medical procedure or some legal thing that needs to be addressed. That's where the legal guardian steps in and has to make those decisions and sign legal documents. So um, that is always a tough one. There are some neglecting clients that we have that refuse to leave their home. So we at APS have to try to ensure that the client is safe, whether it be trying to put in services in the home trying to encourage placement but again that's a very sticky issue because you know the demented client is fixed on staying home and they don't see what the risk and consequences are of staying in that environment so we have to try our best to 
stabilize the home situation as much as possible while we're heading towards the guardianship route. <laughs> no, I, I was just laughing um, because it actually, when you deal with dementia patients, you have to be extremely creative. Yes. And I, and I, I know, I mean, I've seen these situations, and I'm sure Mary has mm -hmm. seen mm -hmm. even more mm -hmm. uh, be doing home visits, but you have to, it's like trying to get someone to stop driving. Yeah. yeah. There's no real legal recourse, but you have to be very um, creative and convincing. I mean, I've had situations where, you know, there's bugs in the house, the house has to be, you know, fumigated, you really need to come out now and, you know, be the, uh, until they can take care of that situation. And then, of course, afterwards, the um, it's been deemed unlivable, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or something like that. And I've seen that kind of scenario, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've seen it's other creative, good one. Yeah. <laughs> other creative ways of getting them out of the house. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, community-based nurse thinks there's neglect for a patient in the home, but the community-based social worker does not. Should the nurse or the social worker make a report? Okay, so we uh, at Intake would like to uh, actually get the report from the person who actually witnessed it because they're the ones that can provide us detailed information and if the intake worker has specific questions, then it's obviously better to get it from that source than a second, third party. However, everybody, if you're working at an agency, you're all mandated reporters. So it really, to us, it doesn't matter who makes the report, just make the report because it's really obviously in the best interest of your client or the vulnerable adult. Um, and if need be, if it's a second, third hand uh, reporter and we need to make collateral contacts with somebody who has maybe first hand knowledge, they will try to make that call. So um, I can't say who should make the report, but it's always best to have it from the source who actually has the concern and witnessed the concern. Are there any plans in the near future to provide 24-hour services for APS cases? Um, that has always been on the table for discussion within our agency. Um, the problem and the challenge with that is if we were to open up a 24-hour operation, what do we do at 2 o'clock in the morning if a client needs placement? Like in child welfare, we had foster homes on standby that got paid a per diem just to have bed space available for mm -hmm. any emergencies. So um, having to establish that kind of uh, network takes a lot, contracts, money, budget, and all of that. And unfortunately, we're really not there yet. And uh, we know that there is a dire need for it, but at this time, nothing that I can see closely down the pike for us to go that route at this time. Once a report has been submitted to APS, do we as the reporter always get a written notice of the outcome? No, you do not. As a reporter, you are entitled to know what we're gonna do with their report. So yes, we're gonna assign it for investigation or it's gonna be an information only. You are not entitled to know what goes on in the investigation because of confidentiality or even the disposition. However, if you are working side by side with the investigator on the case, like you're a public health nurse or a provider and we're gonna leave that ongoing case management services to you or your agency to ensure the stability of that vulnerable adult, then they may share with you the disposition because you're working with them on the case side by side. But um, no, you're not entitled to know the disposition of every investigation outcome. If the guardianship process takes three to six months, what happens in the interim? In the interim, we are trying to ensure stability of the client. So it's sometimes the daily assistants or aides in our office going to the home, checking it out, or if there's providers going in, making sure that they're maintaining the services. So yeah, that, that's been a challenge. So putting services, putting in services in place and waiting for the guardianship hearing. If APS is able to pay, is APS able to pay for any services to care for patients while processing guardianship? 
or arranging for a safe situation for them? It's on a case by case basis. Um, we try to uh, see if that person has any income or assets that can be tapped into to pay for those services. Um, so again, it's case by case, and that's something that we have to get uh, prior prior approval from our administration to use extra funds for that. Liz says, I have a patient in the hospital who is lacking capacity. She has no family. She's outlived everyone she knows. She was previously living alone in senior housing. She remained in the hospital in ICF level. They have referred to the Office of Public Guardian and court date is pending, but in the meantime, she remains hospitalized. What happens in the interim while waiting for a court date and is there no guardian? Um, she can't return home again as it's not a safe environment for her. What can the public guardian do for her? Yeah, that's the challenge. So, I mean, unfortunately, the, I would assume that the client's going to remain in that facility. And even at the once the guardianship is awarded, the public guardian, I'm sure he or she is going to have to tap into the same resources that we are all tapping into for looking in terms of alternative placements and foster homes. And that becomes the challenge, right? And um, getting a foster home provider to come and assess the patient and you know, we're at their mercy. Everybody is, even APS. We don't get a uh, ticket to the front of the line just because we're APS. In fact, we're probably at the bottom of the list because these foster home operators are really, um, you know, they want to ensure that the person has Medicaid or they have their funds available. They're not no going to take a case okay. from us if the Medicaid is pending. And we've, we're in that kind of a dire situation on a daily basis with those situations. So yeah, unfortunately, the public guardian is going to have to look at the same resources that we are all tapping into as well. Okay. Um, once a report is made, how long does it does it take half to make a determination? Okay. Again, that's case by case. Of course. Um, again, as soon as we can determine eligibility, that's the key right there. Um, a lot of times, we are making collateral calls to physicians, um, service providers, just to get that missing piece of information to determine vulnerability or determine the self-neglect component. And without that information, we can't move forward. So it really depends on how quickly we can get a call back from the person that's holding that information for us. Can you give guidance on other options for someone who shows signs of self-neglect but seems to have mental capacity? Mm. You know, we always try to ask the complainant reporter that to continue to be involved or monitor the situation. And at the moment that there is any change in whatever that cognition, right, the decline to give us a call, because that's then, you know, meet the criteria. So sometimes, you know, it's just a waiting game, unfortunately, and people are like, well, then what's the purpose of APS? I mean, we're not a prevention agency, right? We go in once there's been abuse or abuse has occurred. So yeah, I kind of feel like that's the public health nurses' role to mm -hmm. keep watching and monitoring, and then when it when they turn that corner and you think that you're not able to make decisions for themselves, even though you, we can't diagnose, we can yes. we can call you and say, I really think you know they lack capacity, and this is the reason why. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the ADA mm -hmm. is really good because it kind of gives a lot of the descriptors that you'll see that tells me that they lost, um, they may have lost their decisional capacity yeah. and that the time has come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. but I usually will wait until I'm sure about that before I, I um, bother APS. Yeah. But yeah. there are a lot of red flags yes. that I think Certainly. other caregivers and providers should be aware of and even actually should be aware of the ADA. The ADA that people aren't aware is, is basically, um, it's. A, it's screening for dementia, but via the caregiver. So you ask questions. Um, objective things, yeah. like they, they keep repeating the same stories over and over. They can't operate their TV or their microwave, and mm -hmm. they're not paying their bills, their mail's all piled up junk and special documents all mixed together. They haven't, you know, they won't leave the house. They, they're acting different than they used to. Their grooming's bad, all these kind of things. Right, yeah. right. 
Yes. I mean, from a doctor's office uh, standpoint, I would say, you know, if you can see consistent weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, that's another that's, that's thing a huge, we huge one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, malnutrition and weight loss, because oftentimes they're not aware that they're not really eating adequately. Or forgetting that they eat. Or they yes. didn't eat. Or they keep missing appointments. Yeah, I had a guy that yeah. he lived in walking distance from a grocery store, and he'd go there uh, several times a day and get c containers of potato salad and a few donuts. And it got to the point where his refrigerator is so full of that stuff that he was piling it up in his kitchen sink. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, he wasn't, I think he was just living on Cokes, but he was going and buying stuff several times a day, just wasn't eating it. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Uh, I just want to um, just ask Debbie um, Shimizu, I know you're on board. Uh, there, I've, do you have any thoughts or comments from your perspective? Uh, no, I was glad that you um, mentioned the 88 because I was thinking the same thing that um, maybe uh, APS workers, we need to train them on the 88 because that's a tool that they might be able to use in terms of establishing capacity. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. And then the other thing is, Christine, I think we got to work on 24 hour. <laughs> I'll help you. I'll help you guys do that. <laughs> okay, Debbie. <laughs> well, another thing I wanted to add, um, for those of you in the medical field, um, what would be really helpful is when you're submitting your written report, um, the mandate, uh, what we're seeing often is our actual official mandated reporter form. You guys fill out the demographic information, but when it gets to that last page of the narrative and explaining the, the specifics of the concerns that you have, you say, see attach, and then there's like 50 pages of medical notes or, mm. you know, social summary stuff. And, you know, we are not medical professionals. We don't have the time to, to go through that 50 pages and try to decipher what the concern is. So that just delays the process for us to determine eligibility. So if you can really just get to the heart of what the alleged harm or neglect is, and if we need to ask for specific information, like medical stuff, then we'll ask for it. But um, it would really help us at the intake to um, not have just see attached because we're getting a lot of those and it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, will the PowerPoint be made available? Is this something you're going to Yes, you can have it. Sure. Okay. Well, then we'll post it under our resources online. Okay. Yeah. And I think also the guide yes. to mandated yes. reporter yes. is on we there. Will, okay. We'll put that up too. I'm not sure if it's up yet, is it? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, then after this, we'll be posting the guide to mandated reporting in the PowerPoint on our website. Okay. That's it then. Do you want to do your closing remarks? Yeah. Well, nobody had any great cases. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have had some walkers at the stories, but anyway, yeah. All right. Um, all right. If not, you know, in order, just a reminder, in order to get CME credits, go to the webpage, complete the online evaluation form, indicate the type of CE that you want. And there's a link at the bottom of the email invitation as well. And your comments are very important for the planning committee um, to be used for future programs. And if you want to hear more topics on this, uh, you know, please uh, indicate that at, that at that place. So tune in next month, March 11th, uh, 2020. Our topic will be geriatric gynecology, itching. <laughs> Presented by gynecologist Dr. Aya Sultan. Okay, so thanks so much for joining us. Bye.